So welcome to Virtual Venture Cafe, everyone. My name is Shaheen Hakimi. I'm the director here at Venture Cafe in Cambridge. And um, today's workshop is brought to you by BizHack Academy, Dan Gretsch and the team, Lilia Poizos. So before we begin, I just want to set a couple of ground rules from the top. Uh, please keep yourselves on mute, although unless prompted by Dan and the team. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to drop them into the chat. We will be using that. And I'll be the background producer to make sure we queue them up in real time or uh, at the end for Q&A. So I can talk about Dan Gretsch, but why do you need secondhand information? Let, let's, let's hand the mic over to Dan himself and get a little bit of background on him and why he loves doing what he's doing right now. So Dan, on to you. Perfect. Thank you. And um, it's really great to be here. Um, and uh, Shaheen, thank you so much for you know, this amazing community service that you're providing, kind of bringing together, you know, thought leaders and subject matter experts to help entrepreneurs and business owners uh, everywhere and in, in particularly in the Boston and Cambridge area. Really glad to be here today uh, and a uh, great crowd. Thank you guys for, for coming and spending uh, your um, Thursday afternoon with me. Uh, before we get started, I want to invite you guys all to uh, share in the chat uh, your LinkedIn profile, a quick description of who you are and what you do in the world. Um, part of the goal uh, of Venture Cafe and certainly of BizHack is to create community. And so we would love to kind of build a little community today in this next hour on this webinar. Um, we'll give you some great information. Um, the other thing is I wanted to introduce my colleague, Lilia. Um, Lilia is gonna be reaching out uh, to you guys uh, via the chat in case you were interested in scheduling a chat with me. Uh, I've set aside some time to do some follow-ups. Um, you know, digital marketing is a vast and complex and sometimes overwhelming field. And, you know, my mission, as you'll hear soon, is to help uh, business owners uh, tackle and, and master uh, digital marketing to grow their business and, 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 and um, grow their careers. And so uh, if you're interested in, in learning more, in, in having a conversation and, and seeing if there's ways in which we can help, uh, please uh, schedule a, a 15 minute um, chat with me and, and, and I'll uh, tell you how we help entrepreneurs like you. And I'll also um, point you in a different direction if, we, if we're not a good fit. Um, we are part of Venture Cafe Miami and CIC Miami, which is where we got our start uh, back in 2017, started my business there. Uh, and so it's in many ways, it's, it's uh, part of our growth uh, is is now expanding and offering uh, these services um, outside of our, our hometown of Miami, where we're based, um, and and having this become sort of part of what we do. Uh, so it's it's really um, an honor uh, and very exciting to me uh, to be able to be here today and to be able to be presenting to you guys. So today's topic um, is free tools to find your ideal customer online, and this is an interactive. Uh, presentation. I'm going to encourage you guys to use the chat liberally uh, in response to some of the prompts. And, um, and so let's go. So uh, you guys should all have done introductions, putting your name and a brief description of the product or service you sell. Uh, I am Dan Gretsch. I uh, think of myself as a business storyteller. I actually uh, had a 20-year journalism career, which included a stint in Boston at the Boston Globe in 1998. Uh, after my journalism career at NPR, the Washington Post, the Miami Herald, uh, WLRN, the local NPR station here in Miami, uh, ended, I uh, moved into business storytelling as a marketer for a billion dollar company and two software startups. I'm a graduate uh, of Princeton uh, University, so you, uh, any of you Ivy Leaguers, Harvard folks, uh, uh, boo. And then uh, got a master's degree down here at FIU as a Fulbright scholar, and I'm a graduate of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. Um, a little bit more about me is, you know, I grew up to uh, uh, a family of school teachers and coaches, and uh, on my dad's side, soccer coaches, on my mom's side, school teachers. And my mom was an art teacher in inner city Philadelphia for 35 years, and her career and her life was really dedicated to helping um, underprivileged folks, the underdogs, uh, if you will, um, get a good education, uh, get exposed to art, uh, be given a supportive community so they can thrive. And 
Uh, when I was a journalist, I covered, uh, you know, poor folk and, and immigrants. Um, and now as a business owner, I serve small businesses, the underdogs of the economy. And so it's really um, part of my family tradition and my family heritage to, to serve you guys, to serve small businesses and entrepreneurs so you can thrive. And that's really the mission uh, for me and for Biz Academy. Uh, and we've been um, recognized with, by, uh, with lots of awards and partnered with some of the largest colleges and universities. Uh, but the most important work we do is with minority and small business, minority and women owned businesses. Uh, it's one of our specialties, about 70% of our participants are women and 87% uh, are people of color. And uh, we've given out more than $200,000 in scholarships to folks like that. Uh, here's an example of some of the folks that we've worked with. Uh, we're really all about lead generation, helping you find uh, and, and close your customers online. And we do that by uh, helping reduce the cost of finding those leads and increasing the likelihood that they're going to actually do business with you. And we do that for B2B and B2C companies. And more than anything else, we're about building your confidence as an entrepreneur and business owner that you do understand how to market, how to find your ideal customer online, which is really the goal for today. And this kind of knowledge can be incredibly profitable. Um, you know, if you get better at finding your ideal customer and targeting them, you will uh, make more money. Uh, and so this investment that you guys are making of your time, uh, folks who invest in our program, uh, it does pay off. So today we're gonna really talk about um, the six pillars of the digital campaigns, which is our uh, proven process for lead generation online. And we're gonna specifically focus and dive deep uh, on pillar two, which is target audience. Um, this is probably the area which is most essential to your success. If you uh, are trying to market and you don't know who your target audience is and how to find them online, it is extremely difficult to be successful. And so that's really what today is all about, is giving you some free tools as well as a kind of intellectual armature that will allow you to figure out who your ideal customer is and how to find them. Because if you can do that, that's half the battle. We're gonna talk about a uh, concept that we call the persona pairs that we have found incredibly useful for helping uh, identify and target your ideal customer online. And then we're gonna also talk about a concept called interest clusters. This is how Netflix recommends movies to you. And this is how Facebook advertises. So we're gonna talk about how, what is an interest cluster and how do you find uh, using free tools, the interest clusters for your ideal customer. Um, my request to you humbly is to please turn on your videos. Uh, there are a handful of you that don't have your videos on. You know, if you're in a situation where you can't do that, that's fine, but if you do have the option, turn it on. And the reason why is because pedagogical studies show that if your video is on, you're more likely to pay attention and therefore more likely to get the results you're hoping for, which is give me the next 53 minutes and I promise you, you're gonna have a lot of actionable insights that will change your marketing. And in order to do that, I just need you to not be multitasking and to be present with me here. Uh, I also uh, would ask you to do the exercises. Uh, I don't wanna hear crickets. Thanks to those of you who've introduced yourself in the chat. Um, by being present, by engaging in the chat, by having your video on, you're gonna get a lot out of this. If you show up uh, and do the work, you will get the results. And that's what we promise to you. So before we talk about target audiences, I wanna give you the context in which audience fits into the overall digital marketing strategy that you should be implementing. So on the right, Gartner, the top digital marketing think tank in the world has mapped out all the different aspects of digital marketing. And uh, to me, this is an utterly overwhelming uh, a map. It looks like the T uh, and there's no center and you don't know where to start and you don't know where it ends. And this is why those of you who like go to Google or YouTube uh, to try to learn digital marketing have so much trouble. It's because this is the map of digital marketing and it's complex and it's a little bit like a spelunker in a cave. You have a flashlight and you're shining the flashlight in one corner or another, but you have no idea what the dimensions of the cave are. You have no idea uh, how many nooks and crannies. Is it a small cave? Is it a large cave? What you need is someone to flip the lights on for you. And that's really what 
we're going to try to do with the lead building system and specifically with talking about target audiences is we want to give you a framework that you can use to think about who you're going to hire how to measure success what metrics to track and ultimately like where to even get started in this morass in this complex world and this is particularly important for entrepreneurs and small business owners and startups because you're limited in time money and expertise and so let's just give you the playbook and then you can just follow the playbook and that's really what we're all about at bizhack and what we're going to be focusing on today is one of the six pillars um you know we obviously go in depth in other webinars and in our uh, paid programs in all six but i want to give you some really actionable insights on the most important pillar the pillar that without uh, this, you just cannot be successful, which is audience. Now, the foundation of your business uh, marketing is your business story. And Shaheen uh, hosted last session uh, on business storytelling. And we really went in deep of like, what is a business story? How do you tell it? And where do you put it? Today, we're now going to talk about the most important pillar, which is target audience. Uh, but I did want you to understand that this comes in the context of campaign objective which is really how you figure out what metrics matter. Your irresistible offer, which is, okay, you have this, like, this customer identified, what are you gonna give them of value in exchange for their contact information? A thumb stopping video, the vernacular of the web is video and you need to kind of lead with video, put video on all platforms. That's what people, how people communicate online. You need to have really strong and compelling messaging and compelling content. If you're a company that sells to other companies or have a long sales process, it's that trickle of content and that thought leadership that's going to ultimately get them closer to wanting to do business with you. And then finally, the call to action, which is what specific action do you want them to take as a result of your campaign? And so like, for instance, today, my goal, if you consider this like a marketing touch point, you know, in this webinar as a marketing campaign, my call to action is sit down with me for 15 minutes and let me see how I can help you, right? And what I'm doing is I'm moving you along the buyer's journey or the customer journey from first learning about us for the first time to then you and I having a one-on-one -on -one interaction. And, you know, some of you may uh, choose to do business with us. Many others uh, won't, but at least now we have a deeper relationship. You and I are in touch. Um, that's what the call to action is about. And too many of you market without a call to action too many of you market without asking for anything in return for your hard work um, and that is uh like if you watch a youtube video and they ask for you to like or share uh, or subscribe that's a call to action and you just always want to be attentive to having that to move people along the relationship from stranger to customer so as i said today we're going to focus on target audience and let's do this so i'd like you guys to take a minute and think about your ideal customer. Now, I'm not asking you to tell me about a theoretical person. I'm asking you to tell me about an actual person. Like when I close my eyes, I think about Rosemary Ravenel. And Rosemary um, is this uh, really amazing uh, former participant in her program, super uh, engaged, uh, you know, did great in the program, has taken what we've learned, we taught her and run with it. And now actually just today, right before this call, um, I uh, invited her to become a, a certified instructor for us. So for me, my ideal customer is Rosemary, somebody who uh, shows up and does the work and then runs with it after the program ends and then continues to contribute to the community and give back in all sorts of ways. She sent us uh, lots of clients. So. Who is that for you? And go ahead and put it uh, in the chat. Um, you know, Jessica Full, uh, Richard Chen, uh, Paula, go ahead and tell me, like, you can just put their name for now. Like, I just want you to, to just articulate who do you love to serve and who loves you back? Who loves your product or service? Who's profitable for you? Um, you can also think about who's easy to find online. Right. So like if you're trying to decide between, um, you know, people who um, have bad breath uh, or people who uh, are interested in Invisalign uh, teeth straightening services, 
uh, it's going to be really hard for you uh, to find perhaps people uh, who have bad breath and aren't doing anything about it because those folks are not findable online. It's only the, the actions that they take and the behaviors they exhibit that make them easy to find online. So we'll talk more about that, but there, there is a case, as we'll talk about, uh, of folks who uh, are your ideal customer, but they're not findable. And if they're not findable, ultimately, they're not very useful to you. So the, there, there's kind of an art and a science to audience targeting digitally. Uh, the art is, um, and this is where coaching and, 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 and working with experts helps, uh, figuring out, yes, that's someone you can find online and here's how. And I'm gonna give you some of the free tools that us expert, experts use to answer that question today. So um, Ian uh, talked about Bob, uh, a 24 year old, uh, I love it, um, who's interested in creating leading edge video content. Uh, Marcy talked about STEM education consultants. Nil talked about someone who wants to pay taxes smartly. So Nil, that's useless. That's not helpful at all. And I'll tell you why, all of us wanna pay taxes smartly, but someone who wants to pay taxes smartly might also exhibit this type behavior, right? See if you can try to take it one level deeper, right? What, maybe they're educated in a certain way, maybe they're a business owner, maybe they work in certain professions. I, I think all of us wanna pay taxes smartly, but maybe we're not educated enough. So maybe it's the type of person that is self-educated uh, in, in taxes. Maybe it's someone who files their own taxes so like how like you know so they they maybe maybe they use quickbooks or maybe they so like what how would you know right that somebody wants to pay taxes smartly because i can tell you that's not findable online right uh and sorry to pick on you but i was just i was kind of setting you all up to look for that kind of example of something that's um a totally legit theoretical construct theoretical ideal customer but just not findable um so let me see. Uh, so Salvador asked a great question. We're going to address this, uh, which is about B2B or companies that sell to other companies. Um, we talk about two broad sets of folks. There's the buyer or the payer and the user in the B2B setting. Um, so for instance, uh, there might be like a manager or director who's going to actually use your service, your consulting service or your product, your your um, who's going to be the one you're interacting with and interfacing with day to day, but they might have a, a boss or a boss's boss or a CFO or even the CEO, the owner, who's actually making the purchase decision, who's got a control over the purse strings. So there's kind of the decider and the user. Um, and we actually see that construct uh, all the time in B2B. And sometimes there's multiple deciders and multiple users, right? So it's very complex. Um, but at minimum, there's going to be a decider and a user. We also see this, though, in the B to C realm, in the direct to consumer realms. For instance, we'll talk about a dance studio and the dance studio caters to 14 year old girls, but the buyer is their mom, usually. So uh, the buyer and the user are often not the same person. That's why we use the construct of persona pairs because we want to recognize that very few buying decisions, whether they're in a household or in a company are made by one single person. And that's, I think, one of the limitations of targeting one single person or one single type of person, because they often come in pairs. Um, you're welcome, Salvador, good, thank you, precisely. Uh, woo, uh, Michelle is Christy. Um, uh, she talked about new moms. Uh, uh, are relatively easy to find online. Exactly, exactly. So the most active audience in Facebook are new moms because they're up at all hours and they are isolated from their friends and family by the, by the baby. So um, they often uh, are very active uh, on Facebook and Instagram. And so if you happen to be lucky enough to serve new moms or, or moms and parents in general, uh, lucky you uh, because they are um, some of the easiest folks to target. Um, not all businesses um, are going to be able to easily find their customer online in Facebook uh, or, or Instagram, but I will tell you this, they are there. Facebook and Instagram represent 80% of the U.S. population that's online. Every business, whether you're B2B or B2C, has their customers uh, on that platform, whether you know how to find them or not. 
is another question. So we're gonna do a little bit of marketing 101 here. There is a concept in marketing called segmentation. And segmentation simply means taking a universe of people and dividing them into groups. So when you look at this picture here, uh, let's pretend it's the Boston Marathon. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, what are some ways that you could categorize the people on this screen? Just visually looking at this, what are a couple uh, of segments or buckets that you could put people into using the information that's sitting here on the screen? So we have hats, everybody who's wearing a hat or not, excellent. We have shirt color from Marcel, absolutely. They're wearing red or white or green. We have um, the number that's apparent on their shirt, absolutely. Gender, harder to tell, but yeah, you can tell some uh, men and women, but they're, especially as you get a little further back, it gets a little harder. Whether or not they're wearing sunglasses. Um, athletic, well, gosh, it's hard to know if they're athletic. So athletic um, is an example uh, of a, um, like how athletic and what their time is. This picture would make it very difficult for you to segment based on athleticism. However, if you had access to their scores uh, of their, uh, their, their times, then you could segment them that way. So the point here is depending on what data is available to you, you can create segmentations and athletic would require you to know what their times were. There are four ways in marketing and specifically digital marketing in which you can bucket or segment people. Where, where are they? Who are they? What are they doing? And why do they do it? So the first where is geography, where do they live? Um, the next, or, or where are they traveling to? Like Facebook has a setting where you can target people who are visiting an area. Uh, Facebook knows your hometown and they know if you're visiting or traveling somewhere. That's super helpful if you're a hospital, excuse me, a hotel uh, or a restaurant and you're attracting tourists. Who are they? That's ethnicity, gender, income. Um, we call that demographics. What are they doing? And this could be what behaviors do they exhibit in life and what behaviors do they exhibit online? So an example of behavioral targeting, uh, what are they doing? Uh, could be, did they click this button? Did they visit this website? Did they engage with you on social media? All of those are targeting criteria. All of Google search is a form of behavioral targeting. The behavior that we're targeting is the keyword they typed into the search box. And then why, why do they do what they do? Likes and interests. And that's really what Facebook is particularly strong at is identifying the likes and interests and the clusters of likes and interests that characterize your ideal customer. And this is really the topic of today is understanding how interest clusters work in online targeting and how to discover interest clusters as well as some behavioral uh, targeting around search uh, by using some free tools. So when you segment uh, an audience using data, you often are surprised by what you find. For instance, we all think of millennials as hip annuals. And the kind of bad rep that I think millennials get is usually a bad rep related to the hip annual, um, the I can make the world a better place. But if you actually add up millennial moms and old school millennials, they represent a larger proportion of the millennial population than the hip annual. So the uh, you know, the millennial mom and the uh, tech averse millennial actually represent more folks than the hip annual. And this is the power of segmentation is a lot of your assumptions about your audience may be wrong when you actually start looking at the data. And oh, by the way, just because old school millennials only represent 10% of the population, they still might be a very profitable segment for you to target it for your business. So just because segment is small doesn't mean that they're not the target, the segment you should target. It just means that they, uh, there are fewer eyeballs to go after. And of course, the old school millennial is going to be a little harder to target online because they're not as active digitally. That's kind of part of the definition. So you might need to find more creative ways to reach them or not, or more traditional advertising approaches. So that gets us to targeting, which is once you've kind of mapped the universe of options, then you want to figure out who is the specific 
group uh, or segment that you want to target with your campaign. And, um, and the way you figure out who you want to target is, are they definable? In other words, can you really with clarity describe them? Are they findable? This goes to like, can you find, do they congregate in known places online or can you find them online? You know, if they're millennial moms, that's dead easy to find them online. Um, if they're another segment like old school millennials, you might need to go to a bar to find them. Uh, profitable, in other words, if you are able to cat get them and get them to do business with you, I hope you have good margins. Otherwise, what the heck's the point? Have growth potential, which is, you know, ideally these aren't uh, a narrow limited niche that you could get really good at marketing to, but then you kind of run into a brick wall that you run out of them. Um, and then finally, and this is sort of business owner prerogative, which is what the heck's the point of running campaigns against all audiences that you don't enjoy serving? That's why I wanted you to start by imagining your ideal customer, because ultimately we get a lot of choices. Uh, you know, we work hard as business owners and uh, it's a lot of um, heavy labor for little, you know, little pay, uh, especially when you're starting out. You might as well serve the customers you love and that love you back. And, and uh, one of the great liberating moments for business owners is when they fire their first customer. Uh, when they say to someone, look, you're awesome, just you're not for me. Uh, and let me point you in another direction. I see uh, Paula smiling. Everyone, who, anyone who's ever fired a customer, like raise your hand and say, amen. I mean, that is like the best, most empowering feeling in the world. Uh, we fire students all the time for being assholes. Um, and we would rather make less money and have no assholes. Uh, because what the hell is the point? Um, so when you're targeting this segment, you want to make sure it's not so broad um, that it like includes everyone, but not so narrow that there aren't enough eyeballs to actually profitably advertise against them to find them online because in the end the the commodity that you're really dealing with online is eyeballs and can you get the right eyeballs on your content on your message on your offer so the key is that you need to find that kind of goldilocks place and there is an exercise we're going to run you through now that is super powerful for helping you figure out who your goldilocks is and uh, it requires a little bit of a thought experiment. So imagine you own a golf retail store. You sell golf clubs and golf balls. And, uh, and I need you guys to respond in the chat to this question. You wanna target someone who's gonna buy golf clubs and golf balls. What interests do you think that they would have that we, you would use to target them? Go ahead and throw uh, some ideas uh, into the chat. So finance and venture capital. Uh, is one. And uh, Shaheem, don't worry, you, you'll, uh, you'll eventually be able to, you're like, you're fired from Venture Cafe, which is open to the community, but not to you. Um, people who drink good wine, uh, people who like ocean views or outdoor socializing, people who are corporate, who drive expensive cars, who belong to country clubs and drink scotch, uh, who know certain golf brands. Um, who, who have club memberships, especially if it's like uh, certain types of clubs. You know, I don't know if LA Fitness uh, is the right kind of club, but maybe the country club around the corner is. Um, disposable income, uh, interested in networking, maybe people who are in sales. Uh, golfing is a big part of sales. Uh, all of those are fabulous answers. In fact, <laughs> yeah, exactly, Marcy. Uh, in fact, usually uh, I deal with audiences that aren't so savvy uh and you guys would say things like they're interested in the pga the professional golfers association or they love tiger woods uh nobody did that good for you uh you actually uh came up with a cluster of qualities that does actually define the type of person who's more likely to be interested in golf uh, playing golf now what's the problem with tiger woods the common answer and the reason is tiger woods is a celebrity who's in people magazine who is known and followed by many, many people who don't like or know anything about golf. And so in other words, using Tiger, which is sort of an obvious one, uh, it's who Nike hires to promote golf clubs, uh, is not a good targeting criteria for online because it's overbroad. It's gonna get you a lot of false positives. So rather than that, 
we recognize, we recommend that you target Bubba Watson. Bubba who? Anybody know Bubba Watson? Any hands? Any hands? No? Charles is a no. Uh, Chris Hopkins, can you unmute yourself and tell me who Bubba Watson is? I know it says there, but. <laughs> well, my dad, oh, my, yeah. my dad, um, so I know him through, through my dad, but um, yeah, I, I think he won PGA Tour a couple years ago and has been great since. Yeah. So I love that, right? I pretty much knew that if Chris knew who Bubba is, he either is a golfer or has a golfer in his family. And like this has been, I've done this everywhere across the country and just very consistently, people who know Bubba Watson, an influencer in the golf world, the greatest left-handed shot maker in its history, uh, are connected to golf. And I'll tell you, if you're selling golf balls and golf clubs, Chris is a good target for you because he might need to find something for his dad for his birthday or for Christmas or whatever. So Bubba is fabulous for targeting. And what you need to do is you need to figure out who your Bubba is for your company. So we're going to um, do a little exercise and, you know, humor me here, guys. I need you to participate. If, if there's one thing you're going to get out of this, it could be this. This could be the breakthrough for you. It is so powerful to figure out who your Bubba is. So for your industry, what is a super fan term that an enthusiast in your industry would know, but no one else would? For your industry, an enthusiast would know this super fan term, but no one else would. So what's a super fan term? It's an influencer in your industry. It's a thought leader. It's a product or brand name that only someone in that industry would know. It's a trade association. So it can be a person or a thing or an organization. And so when you put your Bubba in there, make sure to mention what your industry or business is, just so I know. And the, the thing about Bubba's is if I know who your Bubba is, it's probably overbroad. Because unless I'm an expert in your industry, I should not know what brand you're talking about, who this influencer is. I don't want Tiger Woods level influencers. You know, if you're in marketing, don't give me Seth Godin, right? Don't give me Russell Brunson. I want that next level down. The fun type of influencers that the super fans know and nobody else has ever heard of. Gary V, everybody's heard of Gary V. He's kind of jumped the shark from a Bubba perspective. He's now in the Tiger Woods category. So uh, the balanced scorecard for strategic planning, nice. Um, Yes, in jargon is a differentiator, as are like really specific SKUs or products. So, you know, Cisco router would be like a good differentiator if you're in the IT space, right? Because really no human, normal human would talk about Cisco routers, but the type of person that searches for Cisco routers in Google uh, or is part of the Cisco router uh, trade association, uh, yeah, that's their life. So that's your customer. Uh, healthcare, value-based care. Uh, so Vish, healthcare is too broad. Like, are you, I guess you're probably interested in healthcare providers, just to get clarity there. Um, strategic planning, uh, Salvador, I'm assuming you're talking about people who are like strategic planning professionals, maybe. Um, menopause, Davina McCall, nice. If I knew who Davina McCall was, that would be problematic. And I have no idea. You know, if you put Dr. Ruth, that's not a good one, right? Because lots of people know Dr. Ruth and uh, okay, uh, Stella McCartney, will you provide us with the slide studio? Yes, I will. Uh, we will be following up with that, plus a couple thank you gifts for sticking around. Let's see, who else? Um, not uh, Peter Thal clinical trials analysis, nice. Isn't jargon bad, Mike asks. Jargon is bad for marketing copy. Jargon is awesome for targeting criteria. Jargon has a very specific purpose. I have a master's degree in, in, in creative writing. Jargon is used to create exclusivity. You're trying with your targeting to create exclusivity. You're using words that only people in the in-group will know. So yeah, jargon is your friend uh, when it comes to marketing, market audience targeting. Jargon is your enemy when it comes to messaging pillar five but today we're on pillar two 
Nice, Stella McCartney, Sustainable Clothing, Ali uh, Abdal, Learning Activities and Productivity, MC4 Connectors, Solar Energy. I think you guys, you're very fast on the uptake in Boston. Uh, you're, this is the, the over-educated crowd. I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying Paula uh, presenting to you guys. I usually present in Miami and they're like, I don't get it. <laughs> it's true. I grew up in Philly and went to school at Princeton and I'm like, sometimes like cheese, man. Uh, but if I did it in Spanish, they would get it. Uh, y hablo español. Um, okay, so let me give you some examples of Bubba that I hope are relatable. Um, the big green egg. Anybody know the big green egg? Ian, do you know the big green? No, you don't know it. Mike. Hey, well, hey, Mike. Nice to see you. Uh, let's see. Arun. Anybody? Any grillers here? Hi, Sydney. Nice to see you back. Nobody knows the big green egg. The big green egg is a thousand dollar grill. Um, we know the big green egg in Miami. I'll tell you that much. Uh, this definitely tells you where our priorities are. So the big green egg is the sort of thing that a grill aficionado would know about, follow, track, monitor, salivate over, buy. And that same guy is also the perfect customer, perfect customer for a pest control service, specifically mosquito control, outdoor pest control service. Mosquito Joe, which is with what they offer, targets families with homes with 100K in income. You do not buy this grill if you don't own a home, love grilling, and have 100K or more in income. So do you see how this one product identifies your ideal customer? Are you guys feeling me on this? Let me give you another example. I target public relations professionals for my training, right? Because if you're in PR, you're probably not that savvy about digital marketing, but you could upsell your customers on digital marketing services if only you knew a little more. And you can use those same techniques to find your ideal customer online and to grow your business. So PR agency owners are awesome customers for BizHack. How do we find them? By targeting Public Relations Society of America and the thought leader that probably none of, none of you have heard of called Michael Smart. Paula, have you heard of Michael Smart? Yes, no? Yeah, exactly, good. If you've heard of him, I'm doing something wrong. Michael Smart is a big deal for these public relations folks and nobody else. So are you guys starting to feel what I mean by an, inter like a, an interest? This is what interest means in the context of digital marketing. And interest targeting is 100% the way to unlock Facebook and Instagram advertising and social media advertising uh, and to an extent uh, through the use of keywords, Google advertising as well. It's really the key to unlocking uh, building personas and finding them online. So let me see, has anyone done it yet? David Beckham. All right, guys, so tell me who your Bubba is. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you have, oh, we already have done that, sorry. Uh, okay, now I'm just, I got distracted by Charles, uh, by Mike's question, but also narrow. Yeah, narrow is critical. Um, or you're, uh, as Ian said, trying to boil the ocean. So, and, and oh, by the way, like super narrow, super niche, because you can use an ad to target a really niche audience uh, as long as they're sizable enough. And then you can use another ad to target a different niche that's also good. So every company has audiences and niches that they can use. Um, and, and the better you get at identifying and targeting those, the more successful you'll be. So let's talk about what an interest cluster is. Sometimes one Bubba isn't enough. One interest, the, the, the green uh, egg, uh, maybe there aren't enough people who are interested in the big green egg to actually create that Goldilocks audience you're looking for. So what you then need is a cluster of interests. And this is a concept that Netflix essentially invented and pioneered and that all of us I think can relate to. Back in the old days, television was divided into key demos or demographics, right? So that's, that's the who targeting. And Netflix changed to a kind of behavioral and interest-based targeting that has allowed them to crush the competition. So they're no longer simply looking at demographics, age, gender, they're now looking at what they call interest clusters. And what they found algorithmically with billions of data points is that there are interest clusters 
around batches of movies that if you like one, you're, t you're very likely to like another. But what's really crazy is they found 2000 of these and many of them have no name or no discernible similarity, but they are a cluster. So you can see this is an actual Netflix. They, they, some of them they just call cluster five. Others they'll call comedy, comedy and drag or Broadway musical. Um, and, and so when you're really advertising at a high, high level, and, and that's like Fortune 500, you know, Facebook level, you might actually have behavioral or interest clusters that don't have any discernible um, common threads, but are actually out there in the world. But for our purposes, what you're really looking for is just a single cluster uh, of interests that help identify your ideal customer. So for instance, um, the behavior, someone who liked Black Mirror, watched it to its entirety, uh, are very likely to also like Lost and Groundhog Day. Lost is in the supernatural cluster and Groundhog Day is in the dark drama cluster. And the way that Netflix talks about this is they say if a member uh, hasn't yet watched Black Mirror, but they have watched Shameless and Orphan Black in the OA, we can be relatively confident in suggesting Black Mirror to them. So their suggestions algorithm, uh, which is something they pioneered way back in the day, um, uses this. But what they've then done is the next level of this, they've used this as a predictive measure of what kind of content do they feel pretty sure people would like. And so they use that to create content. They look at what are the clusters and where are the gaps in programming for those clusters and they can create programming using this data. And that is really how Netflix has become Netflix, is they started out by analyzing usage and then they used it to predict popularity and to try to get a sense of the most difficult thing in the world, which is what's gonna be popular. And Netflix hit, has more hits than any other uh, TV production company in history because they have access to better data and better data scientists. I'm gonna give you a totally different example of how this works in real life and it has incredibly powerful consequences. You might remember that firm Cambridge Analytica. They used interest clusters to figure out who is likely to be an alt-right sympathizer. One of the interests in the cluster was they liked Adam Sandler movies. And you're like, what? Well, look, people on the alt-right have like funny movies too, but they don't like all funny movies. They like all funny movies that involve a man, and a woman and they fall in love and they fall out of love and they fall back in love. That's the kind of movie they like. And those are the kinds of movies that white guy Adam Sandler makes, or at least made. They don't like all the like minority humor movies. Those, that's not so fun for them. So that is a powerful insight that is really not obvious or, or, or intuitive. Something that's a little closer is the single strongest predictor in these interest clusters of alt-right sympathizing is corporal punishment for children or spanking. If you're in favor of spanking, you're extremely likely to be amenable to alt-right messaging and to Trump as a candidate. They figured that out, they got him elected. That's how powerful this can be. And it's all um, talked about in that book, uh, Mind F uh, by Christopher Wiley. One other quick thing I'll mention is there is no single interest that really was a perfect predictor. Uh, it's that cluster of interest. Like if they like spanking and Adam Sandler movies and, 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 then they can be like 98% sure that this is someone who's gonna vote for Trump if they give them the right message. So there's a really cool tool in Facebook. Uh, and just because of the short time, we won't get a chance to demo it. Uh, that allows you to get a little bit of data uh, about these insights. It used to be a little bit more robust, but with the um, Apple iOS changes, Facebook has kind of scaled it back a little bit, but it's still uh, a great teaching tool uh, and it's still a free tool that you guys can use. Um, and it's inside of Facebook Business Manager. Uh, to get there and you'll have access to these slides, you go to business.facebook.com slash insights. And if you click on uh, slash people, you'll actually be able to uh, use audience insights, which is what this is called, to discover the size of the audience, the gender, the age, and the interest of the audience. So like for instance, um, the US population that's on Facebook is 250 million. And you can see on the, of those Facebook users, this is their gender breakdown uh, and their age breakdown. More men, uh, more women than men, almost 60, 40. 
Now let's do another thought experiment. Uh, you're running a pet shop now. It's called Eileen's Pet Shop. She's one of our lead instructors and she has two ideal customers, two people who she loves to serve and love her wife back and they're Chihuahua owners and Rottweiler owners. And um, let's just say for argument's sake, these Chihuahua owners and Rottweiler owners buy the same products. They buy the same pet food, right? Um, and maybe that's not right. Maybe there's big dog and little dog pet food. But just for the sake of argument, give me this one. They buy the same pet food. In other words, same shop, same product, two different audiences. Do we message them differently? Right? Let's ask Facebook audience insights. So there are 3.6 million people who love chihuahuas uh, in Facebook audience insights. I know that because I just stuck chihuahuas, the interest, uh, 18 to 65 plus in all genders. And what you can see is Chihuahua lovers tend to trend a little older, uh, 45 and older, and they're 85% of them are women. Now let's look at Rottweilers. People who are fans of Rottweilers uh, trend much younger, uh, 44 and younger, and they're less likely to be women. Instead of 85% women, it's 65% women. So, and there's a few more Rottweiler owners and Chihuahua owners who knew. When you then scroll down um, and you look at the top pages that these folks like, Chihuahua owners love sun gazing. What's sun gazing? Sun gazing is an influencer. It's a quote, public figure, positive vibes only. <laughs> I love this. This totally gives you the sort of hippie vibe of these guys. One day I would like to turn on the news and hear there's peace on earth. All right, remember, same shop, same dog food. Their other ideal customer, their favorite page is the tipsy bartender <laughs> uh, who gives you, like I literally watched a video of him showing how to create a five gallon jug uh, of mixed drinks. Um, like it could not be further from positive vibes only, peace on earth is the news headline. So one store, two totally distinct customers. Chris, you nod yes or no. Do we use the same messaging and offers to the Chihuahua versus the Rottweiler? No, even though it's the same dog food, right? Like give this food to your dog to make your Chihuahua flourish versus give this food to your dog so you can drink in peace. Do you know what I mean? Like to your Rottweiler so you can drink in peace. Totally different message, totally different targeting. That's the essence, guys, of, of digital marketing is you need to find these ideal customers online and then give them very specific targeted messaging and offers that's going to appeal to them. So um, I won't have a chance to demo, but you will get this step by step guide uh, in how to do it. But basically, the idea is you just stick your Bubba term into the interest and then just see what comes out and you'll learn not only about their age, gender, demographics, uh, but also what their favorite pages are. And you might, might find something useful, interesting, insightful in there. Um, so next concept I want to introduce with the time we have is a really powerful concept called the persona pair. And I feel like we have already touched on this, so I'm going to move pretty fast. A persona is a caricature of your ideal customer. So now that you've named your ideal customer, you're gonna list the qualities of that ideal customer. You're gonna say, Bob is 37 years old. He really likes this, he really likes that. And you're gonna amalgamate sort of some of the different characteristics that your ideal customer has into a persona. And that persona is who you market to, right? Because remember, marketing is all about one to many. It's like you communicating digitally to lots of folks. Um, and so you wanna have someone you're talking to rather than try to talk at a screen. Um, I remember when I was an NPR journalist, um, I used to use a, a little stuffed animal. Uh, I put him six feet uh, from me and I would deliver my uh, scripts to the stuffed animal. Uh, it gave me the right projection and it gave me a kind of warm tone of voice that allowed me to, um, to get my best performance. That's what a persona is. Like, I happen to be looking a lot at Paula today because you're very expressive, you're attentive, you're smiling, you're shaking your head, you're like another human being. Like I am just like talking to you right now and then Charles and Marcel and Marcy are feeling me 
you know, and Michelle, you also are another one who like just kind of stands out to me as like attentive and listening. Uh, Sydney, you're like leaning in. So I'm just like picking you guys out and talking to you. And I'm more effective as a presenter as a result. That's what a persona does for you and what it's about. A hearing aid company, their target persona is dude with hearing loss, like really obvious, really straightforward. You know, there's only one problem. Dude with hearing loss denies he has hearing loss and does not want to buy hearing aids. So who do you think actually buys the hearing aid? It's Jane, his wife. That's a persona pair. Got it? There's the user and the buyer. And, you know, these, uh, the, the, sorry, these are not all their personas. Uh, sorry for the typo there. Uh, there's still Alice and Bob, Brian and David, but Franco and Jane live in the same house and Jane is buying it for Franco. And that's a persona pair, right? It's not the whole universe of personas, but it's really important for you to think, is there a persona pair to my ideal customer? Um, and I'll explain why in one sec. Persona pairs are often husbands and wives. You know, Grill Dad has his soccer mom wife. Um, they're both, you know, using the same mosquito pest control service, but Grill Dad is all about not getting eaten up while he's cooking and having sure, making sure that when he hosts the company, they're comfortable. Soccer mom's all about protecting the kids, right? Different motivator, different messaging, same product. Parent and child, dance studio, uh, dance mom and her teenage daughter, can't find the teenage daughter and advertise to her because she's under 18. So Facebook and Instagram are out. TikTok, however, great space to be. So go find the teenage daughter on TikTok and create FOMO while you advertise to the mom on Facebook and Instagram. And then in the B2B context, different people inside of a company, you have the, the CFO, decider, purse, purse strings, and then the user, the manager, director. Um, why build two personas? Number one, um, persona pairs often make the buying decision together. You know, women, wives famously buy for their husbands, but they ask them first, do you like this? Uh, the other is that if you cannot find persona one or their persona one is just not responding to your uh, ad campaign, your marketing campaign, then you have an option with persona two to get at them the same way. Um, it's basically like different on-ramps to the same destination. Uh, and then we talked about this, but like, let's say I sold socks online, um, you know, it would be really awesome to know who has holes in their socks, but you can't find them online. Nobody advertises the fact that they have holes in their socks. Maybe though, if they're a dancer, they'll need your socks. So you have to find another targeting criteria, another interest to put in your cluster uh, to find them. That, that is a, a, tr a test and repeat uh, trial kind of thing. So we've talked about Facebook Audience Insights as a fabulous tool for finding these clusters. Let's talk about a few others. Um, many of these are provided by Google. Uh, one of my favorites is called uh, Google Trends. It's trends.google.com. And this is super fun. Like you just put two terms uh, into, the chat, into the search um, and see which one wins. Uh, I put Chihuahua and Rottweiler. And interestingly, uh, Chihuahua actually has uh, significantly more search traffic than Rottweiler. So even though Rottweiler has more people on Facebook, slightly more, Chihuahua has more people on Google. Uh, that's a way to think about it. So Google Trends, it doesn't give you absolutes. This is a relative scale, zero to 100, but it will show you relative, uh, relative uh, Rottweiler uh, has more searches than Chihuahua. You don't see any seasonality here. But sometimes with some search terms, like I guarantee you, you put Santa Claus, you'll see a spike during Christmas. Um, sorry. Uh, what do you use Google Trends for? You can use that to measure the popularity of your Bubba and to also see if there are alternative terms to your Bubba that might be better. Um, it gives you a relative sense of the size of your market. It allows you to communicate in the languages of your customers. Do people use digital marketing or online marketing, for instance? Um, advertising versus ads. You can like test words and see which ones are getting searched more. Uh, it also allows you to track trends and seasonality. Um, you know, COVID-19 uh, exploded a year and a half ago. It didn't exist before then. Um, and then it also allows you to then take like a screenshot of this and throw it into a proposal. And suddenly you have like really cool stuff to share uh, with the client. 
Another really powerful tool that Google gives you access to for free if you create a free ad account is Google Keyword Planner. Basically, you type a keyword in. Um, it could be like a pet store, and then you see uh, what related terms. So uh, we I put Chihuahua, and it allows you the more generic terms like small dog, dog breed, small breed. You know, this might be like, oh, I hadn't thought about the word breed, right? Like, so using this keyword planner helps you. And then the other thing is, you know, you'll learn about like a common misspelling of Chihuahua. You'll learn about Chewini. I guess that's like a nickname for Chihuahua. I don't know. Uh, you'll also learn about um, types of Chihuahuas. Um, so it gives you a lot of insight um, into sub segments and the words that your ideal customer uses and also some broader categories they fit into. Really, really helpful, powerful stuff. Um, answer the public is another great topic, uh, place to go. Basically, you type one word in and then they tell you all the search queries that pe basically the questions that people ask Google. So Google is uh, what's known as a um, natural search uh, queer, uh, engine. So you don't need to use Boolean search. You don't need to use end or 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 not. You can actually use uh, what pet store. Uh, you just like ask Google a question and answers it for you and answer the public tells you what are the most common questions using your keyword that people ask. Uber suggests another really powerful tool. It's more technical around SEO, search engine optimization. Um, so I just wanna uh, remind you like these are the six pillars. Uh, we've really focused on target audience. Uh, and I want to tell you about Megan uh, Hill, a book editor who used these technique to run a campaign. So she basically had no online presence um, and she needed to get the word out quickly about her book editing business. So what she did is she picked traffic as a campaign objective, um, which means getting people to fill out this lead generation form. She, her ideal customer for her book editing business was rich aspiring memoirist. Um, what's interesting is you can't find aspiring writers as a search criteria. So she used people who are into reading as a proxy for that. So people who are into reading uh, was sort of her bubba, but you can't even find that. So she used instead Goodreads and the New Yorker as her proxy for people who are into reading because people who are into reading are into writing, right? Like magic, it's not easy, right? And it took a lot of coaching to figure this out and some experimentation. That's why people, you know, work with us because it's not obvious, but once she got this, watch what happened next. Her irresistible offer, free 30 minute consultation. Um, you know, this basically got them to want to give her contact information, them her contact information. She used a very simple video. She only used 14 words in her ad. It doesn't have to be long. Helping people bring their stories to life on the written page, free phone consultation and look at the results, $420, $29 spent, $105,000 in new business. A, uh, that's a 200X return on investment. Sorry about the formatting there. And Megan said, in just a few weeks, I built an online platform from scratch, launched a marketing campaign and attracted enough clients to keep me busy for a year. And that's really what we're all about, guys. We champion the underdog so you can thrive. Uh, we want to give you the power to pick your customers and to grow your company. Uh, we do this in three ways with companies. We offer classes. In fact, we just announced, and Lily, if you could put this into the chat, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a steal. It's $60. It's three master classes. We're doing it in collaboration with Miami-Dade County to help COVID-impacted businesses. Uh, we're going to talk about, just like we're doing here with audiences, we're going to talk about Instagram, website audits, and LinkedIn. Would love for you guys to sign up and be a part of that. We're very proud of that. We also have a five and seven week program where we really dig in uh, to social media advertising and LinkedIn if you're a B2B company. And we do also offer fractional CMO and consulting packages on content strategy, business storytelling, and, and digital marketing strategy. And Lily is going to also put in the chat, if you'd like to ha uh, have a 15 minute chat with me about you and your needs, would happy to be talk, talk through these with you and also point you in a better direction if we're not able to help. So next steps, uh, we're gonna give you as a thank you gift, uh, a persona worksheet that you guys can use. It'll be part of the follow-up email. And I do invite you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me. 
this persona worksheet will, it's like an editable PDF and it'll allow you to practice what we talked about today around interest clusters and other types of uh, targeting. Um, with that, I just wanted to say Seth Godin, one of the gurus of digital marketing says, it's never too late to start heading in the right direction. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, I'm Dan Gretsch with BizHack and our mission is to give you a simpler way to grow. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you and the time. And uh, thank you Shaheen uh, for the opportunity. Uh, really enjoyed uh, a Boston crowd. You guys are sharp as, as tacks.